The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Greetings, friends. It is a Tuesday evening uh, in the middle of the summer, in the middle of July, and uh, ironically, and because of some production schedules, uh, this is my first taping of the week, even though you're seeing this on the Tuesday program, just kind of the way schedules worked out. Uh, we're going to, we, we double taped on Monday for our Monday and Tuesday shows, so I am soon to tape my show last night. And the reason I tell you that is because I'm still reeling, like I think most Americans are, from President Trump's joint press conference with Vladimir Putin. I'm sure by the time you have seen this, there has been, well, obviously there's going to be just 30 hours of news cycle uh, that will be nonstop regarding it. But I will tell you, um, mind blower, an absolute mind blower. And we will step into that conversation on this program over the course of this week, have to. In fact, we might rearrange some of our guest scheduling just to do so because uh, it was historic. I don't want to overreact to it. If you watch the show on a regular basis, you probably know that I'm no big fan of the president. Uh, but uh, I don't have the credentials to uh, mark best ever, worst ever moments in U.S. presidential history, but that's got to be a top tenor in the worst moments in presidential history and perhaps even higher. Uh, so we'll, we'll work on that uh, over the course of the week. Uh, in the meantime, it is important that we focus on the things that are happening here in our own community. And we've got, you know, our own melodrama in Rhode Island when it comes to the politics of the State House. And the House Speaker, Nick Mattiello, who is going to be defending himself once again against Steve Frias, the Republican candidate who fell just 87 votes short last time in 2016 in upending uh, Nick Mattiello in that race. So we welcome Steve back to the broadcast once, twice, who knows, right? Who knows what's going to happen? Now you didn't get, you, you, I just, you know, we're, we're loose on this show. You didn't get a chance to see the, the Trump-Putin thing. Not at all. Uh, it, so it, you know, Steve, Steve isn't um, helping my satiation for that conversation. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's kind of funny because, and, and you're kind, you are, uh, to your credit, kind of a Rhode Island historian when it comes to politics yes. and the yes. like. And, you know, I was thinking today prior to, it was after yoga this morning. I was, you know, I do a little deep thinking after yoga. Uh, downward facing dog does something for me. And I was thinking about how important this summit is with Putin and, and the president. And then I was thinking, you know what? The kids are at camp. It came out of the Y. The yeah. kids are at camp. People are working out. They're taking their yoga lessons. The country seems to at least to this juncture, to be able to run itself. Yes. But the great thing about the country is that we have uh, local government matters, like state government, local government matters. Like mm -hmm. the, the wheels turn by making good decisions on leadership at home. Correct. And so I was thinking, yeah, it is, is kind of neat that Steve is coming in. We're going to refocus on some of the local elections. Uh, I don't know that we operate despite Washington, but in many ways, we really have to value the decisions we make on a local level. Yes. And I mean, so you have a historic, without, without your candidacy and all that, yeah, yeah. But you, have a, you, you have kind of a, a thinking philosophy on that? Well, basically, I think democracy starts at the local level and moves its way up. If it's dysfunctional at the local level, it'll get more dysfunctional at the federal level. Because if you look at stuff, if we don't care about what's going on in our local communities, we're not going to care about what's going on in Washington. So the biggest problem I find when I talk about democracy and stuff in our republic is getting people who are apathetic caring about what's going on. And if you go door to door and you talk to people, if they're paying attention, they are informed, I feel good about democracy. I may not always agree with the result of the election, but at least that's a good sign. When people are tuned out, turned off, that's when bad things can happen in a country and bad things can happen in democracy. And you usually start seeing it at local levels and then it filters its way up. As a Republican, 
how much national Republican confusion hmm. impacts your brand here in this race running against the Speaker of the House? In my race, and I, I will say that Republican issues at the federal level does trickle down to state and local issues to some extent, but it's more if you're running for federal office, like if you're running for U.S. Senate in the state of Rhode Island, what's going on in Washington and with the president is going to really impact you. But for me in my local race, I get maybe one to two percent of the voters who even talk about federal issues because when I go to the door, they see me as a state rep candidate, they see state issues, and they talk to me about state issues and very rarely does it come up federal issues or President Trump or you know whatever's going on. Uh, I don't get questions about North Korea, for so, example. So where does the so where does being a Republican uh, running against the Speaker? I don't know if we've shown the Speaker yet. We should probably uh, throw a picture up just in case you're, you're, you're trying to figure out who this guy is. Uh, it is it is by the way horrifying to look at polling results about how many people don't know who the Speaker of the House and who the Senate President are. Mm. Uh, Does your party affiliation uh, impact, well, how does it impact the race? I mean, obviously, you're going to run against him in the general. Right. Um, is, there is there a philosophy? Are you marrying up to the state Republican Party? Mm -hmm. This year, it's so, it's so broken up with candidates. Factions. Factions, right? Right. Tell me about the brand. Does it matter? Yeah, it does matter. I mean, the Republican Party, people do vote for you based on your party affiliation. Um, Democrats will vote against you just because you're a Republican. Republicans may vote for you just because you're a Republican. That does happen. There's no question about that. But what I find with my brand and when I talk to people, I usually run on basically good government and fiscal conservatism. That's basically been my brand. That's been what I campaign on. Um, and that's what I focus on at the doors. And that's what people respond to when they talk to me. Do other issues come up? Do other things go on in the race? For example, does the governor's race come up? Certainly the governor's race comes up. You can't run for state rep without talking about the governor. And I can tell you, obviously, I'm not a supporter of Governor Raimondo. And I'm a supporter of, of Mayor Fung. And, I'll, you know, and that's what comes out in the conversation. So the governor's race, I would say, has some impact. And what your brand as a candidate has a major role in who you are and how successful you are at the doors in talking to voters. And like I've said, I've, I've always, my brand and what I've tried to focus on is basically being for the taxpayers, fiscal conservatism, and also being for the public interest and being for good government. All right, why well, don't we do this? I'm going I'm to break here. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about an issue that really has been instrumental in, uh, in Steve's uh, you know, race last time and this time is the Paul Sox. But he's got some Interesting points on uh, line item veto and the like that I think are worth listening to. Stay with us, please. And they were very interested in the bill going forward. I still expect and believe that staying in Rhode Island is the Paw Sox first priority. It's a good vehicle. It's, it's, it's designed to protect the taxpayer. The investor has taken all of the risk. You know, this is this uh, this is a really funny place now. The Speaker of the House, I don't know. I'm not going to say champions. Kind of passive aggressively led with his nose held like this, a alternative piece of financing for mm. the Paw Sox yes. uh, potential new stadium. And I blame it squarely on you. Uh, okay. And I say that, you know, with tongue in cheek. You know, I, yeah. you have a right to your opinion. You, uh, you've, Thank you. you've done your diligence as a, as a citizen. You and I bumped into each other at, at, at citizen meetings on mm -hmm. the Paw Sox financing. You're, uh, you made it an issue two years ago. You've made it an even stronger issue this time around. Mm -hmm. um, is it instrumental in your decision to run again against Speaker Mattiello, who you narrowly lost to by 87 votes last time? It was a factor. I mean, it was a factor. There was, I made my decision to run basically over Father's Day weekend. And at that point, there were things going on in the legislature I wasn't liking. Mm -hmm. Line item veto was going nowhere. Yeah, we should talk about that in our next segment at, at length because yeah. it's an important thing. And then the, the budget, was I was dissatisfied with it. We're misusing 911 fees in there. We're having new sales taxes in there. And then the Paw Sox bill seemed to be going forward. And I was like, he's not listening to the voters in his community. I thought after you, you know, this is my opinion. When you come that close to losing, usually you have 
a moment where you say, something has gone wrong. I got to change what I've been doing. I'm going to start listening to my constituents. And I thought he would change or he would retire. Okay? Instead, he kind of continued on, you know, zigzagging around, but he ended up in kind of in the same place. Zigzagging around in. what, Steve? What, what's he zigzagging around? I'll give you the Paw Sox thing is the, probably the best example of the zigzagging around. Well, okay, so why don't we do this? You, let's you and I have a good conversation sure. on the Paw Sox thing. Then we'll talk about it in reaction to Matty Edel. Okay. Uh, you and I don't agree on, on on what I think is the public the public private financing model mm -hmm. uh, for for the stadium. Let me go backwards. Well, let me go to the end first, then we'll work our way back. The irony is, mm -hmm. is that this piece of garbage that they just passed Correct. brings guys like me, who've been fighting guys like you, mm -hmm. more to your side in the sense that it's full of Swiss cheese holes and it's a bold-faced lie Correct. that it takes the taxpayers off the uh, the, the, the the what's the term uh, you know off the uh, off the hook off the off hook the, thank yeah. you the, yeah. off, off the, just back from vacation yeah. uh, off the hook so we'll circle back to the end first but originally yeah I thought the Senate process with lots of public hearings and um, a pretty good vetting and apportioning the Paw Sox making the most mm -hmm. significant investment in the International League in a local stadium or mm -hmm. new project. The city and the state, proportionally, actually the Paw Sox first, the, the state mm -hmm. second, and the city first, were a almost replicate of the format of what we have right now for mm -hmm. the current McCoy, mm -hmm. and b a healthy statement about a community investment in quality of life and an economic formula. Why did you disagree even with that premise? Okay, I was going to say I come from the premise that one, what I've seen from economic studies. Stadiums, sports teams don't pay for themselves. They don't create the jobs. They don't create the revenues that they always forecast. Number one. Number two, I don't particularly believe that the government's role should be in engaging with basically using taxpayer money for private businesses. I believe in tax relief for all businesses. I believe that's the appropriate model to generate economic development, not with particular what I call tax subsidies. You would call it investment into a particular business. And then lastly, if we're going to go into debt, the taxpayers are going to be on the hook. I believe in voter approval. That was one of the lessons about 38 Studios, I thought, which is that we don't put taxpayer money at risk through debt unless we give the voters the final say if it's going to involve a private business for purposes of economic development. Now, like I said, I'm not, you had, a, I believe, a respectable, credible viewpoint on that. I happen to disagree with it, as did other people. What was fascinating about the Mattiello zigzags is that there was two camps. People like myself who believe taxpayer money should not be used. People like yourself who believe there should be a taxpayer investment. He went with door number three, which made no sense to anyone. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. It was like, it's, true. It, it, it's like, if you don't believe in taxpayer money being used, the Mattiello plan uses even more taxpayer money than the Senate version. Well, it costs more money to, to, because to of the afford the financing. Right. And if you haven't paid attention to this, folks, you really have to. At least, at least on, the, on, on, on the former plan, the Senate's plan, there was you know, the, the, the opportunity to use the state's good bond rating. In this particular case, we're going to be out you know, selling revenue bonds that will be held by the Pawtucket Redevelopment Agency. And the speaker is saying, look, I've taken the state off the hook, but still the state's still going to apportion money uh, you know, for, for the financing of it. And the truth of the matter is, is that if this thing ever went belly up, I don't believe it will. I, 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 don't, I don't believe all the naysayers who think this business won't thrive or at least survive and provide a quality of life. But if the Pawtucket Redevelopment Agency ever went belly up, and they, they would make the same claim that the state did on the 38 Studios bonds, which is that we'll never be able to borrow another dime for development in Pawtucket again. We need help, and someone will have to bail them out, and that'll be the state. I, can't, I cannot imagine that the city of Pawtucket would allow these bonds to go down, go under, and that the state would just stand aside and say, couldn't, oh, uh, couldn't uh, responsibly think, uh, do it. Yeah, it would be, that is basically, he is creating technical language when we know there's a reputational risk on the bond market. If a bonds in a community go down, there is a ripple impact on that community, and then the state is going to not allow Pawtucket to go downhill. That is, 
It is unbelievable to me in how he created door number three, which was it costs more money to the taxpayers, and by the way, it costs more money for the team. So you will agree with me on this, that at least the Senate version was more stable. More credible. Thank you. So here you have, so Steve's done <laughs> a good job of laying it out. You know, for it, I mean, against it, for it, and now the middle plan is just muck. And I, I think that uh, we are yet to, and I, I would, the Pond Sox are in a tough spot because if they say we're out of here right now, they got a bunch of home dates that'll go even, yeah, 20 south, games even, maybe. even yeah. souther. I, I would imagine if I was them, I'd be fiddling and diddling all summer with this thing, wait to the end of the season, and then uh, unless Worcester, the other bidder, who has a very clean deal on the table reportedly, you know, demand some kind of an immediate response, and they have to just say, "Okay, we're going to play our games to Holy Cross." I mean, seriously. I mean, it, it, it's until the stadium is built. Um, you kept suggesting, though, in the last election, that this was a big issue for the district. I don't believe that. I don't believe the Speaker of the House's political life depends on the stadium in Pawtucket in your district in Cranston. You can't. You can't sell me that. I'm sorry, I can't. All I can tell you is I got over th almost 300 signatures from going through people's, through the district canvassing, and it was about two to one against. So I'm sorry I can't sell you that, but that would be the proof if I brought my petition yeah, to you. Yeah, I think, well, I would just have to think, you're, you're pretty deft in arg making arguments as a lawyer and, uh, and a writer. Uh, don't tell me you don't uh, sell the concept a little bit before you get your two to one against. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> We'll see if that has an impact. You think this? So you think this Paul Sox thing has as much, uh, as much as, less as, the same or more impact in this election? More impact. In the based last, based on the process or based on the actual plan? Both. The pl actual plan. The, the 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 plan, is I think, unsatisfactory to both pe both camps that we basically epitomize in some ways. The people who believe there should be a, 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 a an investment people who don't believe taxpayers should fund it. I think that, that the process hurt him as well. When you tell the voters, I'm not for do, doing a stadium, the public doesn't want it, and then you zigzag to, we're going to make a better deal, and you spend four or five months talking about some secret better deal, you unveil it around Memorial Day, you zoom it through at the end, now it's like people don't, and then you try to sell it as there's no risk to the taxpayers. The process is bad. The end result is bad. I think it's a bad thing to be selling. All right, one thing this candidate and I certainly agree on is line item veto and how that, you know, that, that ooh, when we come back, stay with us. All right, so this is a conversation, uh, short and sweet, that I absolutely agree with this candidate on. I don't know why the Speaker of the House. I do know why, because he and I have argued about it. The good thing about Nick Mattiello is, to be honest, you know, other than how he played this Paul Sachs thing, he'll come in here and he'll fight. Mm -hmm. You know, he believes in the power of the House Speakership. Yes. He really does. And, mm -hmm. and, and he thinks that the line item veto, uh, which, you know, 44 other states have, mm -hmm. is something that would, would test his power and the House uh, authority. Uh, you say we need it. I say we need it. Most of the public says we need Absolutely. it. Absolutely. How big will this be in the in the campaign? Oh, I think it's going to be an important issue. I mean, when people look at government reform, they are dissatisfied with the status quo of the state house, and this is a situation where people feel the spending is out of control to some extent. They see taxes increase here or there, and they feel like we need something to try to rein in the spending. We need someone to rein in government, and line item veto is a means. It's not guaranteed but it's a means to achieve that. And Speaker Mattiello has been opposed to it. Not opposed to, opposed to it basically because it harms the prerogatives of the Speaker and the House. That's what it comes down to. In the end, all the blah, blah, blah at the Line Item Veto Commission comes down to we like it just the yeah, way it is. That, was that a joke or what? It that was, Line Item Veto Commission. It, it was, I was disappointed in it. Okay, I believe in giving people, in acting in good faith and giving things a chance. I went there, I testified, other people testified, and I felt afterwards that it was already a pro, a, you know, pro, preordained. It was already decided, we are going to talk about this, but we're not gonna do anything. And you have the co-chair there is Ken Marshall. 
Now, Ken Marshall was appointed to this important position, and the guy can't do his campaign finance reports. Yeah. You know, he and he's not running for re-election. He's not running for re-election. Yeah, so he's there basically to do the speaker's bidding. So, okay, we agree on that. Let, let's talk about the big picture for just a few minutes. This could be a be careful what you ask for scenario. Mm -hmm. Steve Frias, one more whack, takes the incumbent out and leaves us with a, with a power vacuum with this ongoing battle in the House, of, in, the, in, in state government in general, but specifically in the House be, between progressives and, for lack of a better term, Matty Yellow type of Democrats who are much, much more closely aligned overall mm -hmm. with the way you think government mm -hmm. ought to be run. Mm -hmm. You're going to take, you know, you're going to chop off the head? And, and, and leave a leave a confounding mess and a race toward a progressive liberal spending spree? What happens? Well, I'll tell you what I think doesn't happen. I do not think the progressives take over. If the progressives had the vote to take over the House, they would have taken it over already. Okay? So, number one, I don't well, believe that will occur. 2018 is going to be another incremental growth for them. And, well, and, and who stands as the next Speaker of the House? Joe Sicarci? Maybe. He's the majority leader now. You know, Joe's a wonderful guy, but I don't know, I don't even know what his philosophy is. Well, Joe Sakachi, what I believe is that he's... Would you support him? I'm not going to say who I would support for Speaker. I'll support a Republican, I'll tell you that right now, for Speaker. Not How that are you going to get a Republican? No, I understand that, but I'm just telling you that not I was... people in the phone booth. No, there's... Let's hope that the phone booth gets a little bit bigger. That's my old, I'm running, other people are running, we can maybe grow, increase the caucus size. But with that said, with Joe Sakachi, he's the majority leader right now, he's basically probably the heir apparent would be what you usually look at here. And to me, he's not, I don't consider him some like, you know, you're talking about progressive from the east side of Providence, okay? So I think that he would likely be successful, likely succeed as speaker is one scenario. Another scenario is that the Republicans gained enough votes and we could probably try to work a coalition with other Democrats and put a working coalition together in the House that gets good legislation through. Because you have to, it's not just my race, I it's just other. wonder if Democrats will, will um, uh, allow for some kind of coalition branding like that, or whether, because there's gonna have to be some identification, because the, 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 the progressive group growing has branded themselves. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. The only kind of dynamic we had like that was when Kacheri's first year, when that was, uh, that was a long Decimo, Decimo yeah. with the Republicans. All right, to come back often during the election. Appreciate uh, you coming in. It'll be interesting. Thank you very much. District 15, Steve Fries running for office. So we'll wrap up when we come back, Steve. So again, uh, this Tuesday night program we take before our Monday program for production reasons. Uh, I, I promise you sometime in the next few days we're going to process what just happened uh, between the leaders of this great country and them. So stick around. We'll get to it. See you tomorrow on the radio at 3. Bye.